Before we get going, two quick announcements. First of all, thanks to our sponsor for this series, ideamarket.io, a cool project you'll hear more about later in this episode. And second, I'm pleased to announce that we have a guest narrator for Marius Episode 1. Grit Cult is an entrepreneur, consultant, and experimenter active in the crypto space. Grit Cult is, of course, not his given name. It's a pseudonym, and uh, he's most active on Twitter as an Anon. And that's where we met over the internet. Grit Cult has got a lot of interests in philosophy and culture, and what do you know? He's a fan of the ancient life, too. To find out more about him and his projects, Twitter is probably the best place to start, at Grit Cult, spelled like it sounds. Give him a follow if you like technology, cultural commentary, and the occasional contrarian take on contemporary affairs. The first Roman emperor... Augustus, wanted to restore his people's confidence in their leaders. By the beginning of the reign of Augustus, the Romans were looking back at a hundred years or so of civil conflict in the Roman Republic, that is, when Rome was still a collective government. There was peace at times over that period, but what stuck out in people's memory were the wars that pitted Roman against Roman on a massive scale. And now it had all ended, with the Roman government being converted into a monarchy. They still called themselves a republic, but we call it the Roman Empire from there on. Now, Augustus wanted the Romans to look forward with optimism. All that war was over. Augustus had won. We had won. And he had a grand new forum built, the Forum of Augustus, and in it there was a great monumental portico, a shaded colonnade, where Citizens could get relief from the hot summer sun and do their business under the watchful eyes of heroes from the past. There were large niches along the wall with statues in them. Some of them were mythical founders of the city, like Aeneas and Romulus. Other statues, though, portrayed the great men of the Republic. And one of those statues depicted a grim, middle-aged man with an imposing brow and tousled hair, and a likeness demonstrating the harsh and bitter character of the man, as Plutarch later commented. And the inscription under this statue read like this. This is translated from the Latin. Gaius Marius, son of Gaius, seven times consul, praetor, tribune of the plebs, quaestor, augur, military tribune. Contrary to the rule governing provincial assignments, waged war as consul against Jugurtha, the king of Numidia, and captured him, and celebrating a triumph in his second consulship, ordered that the monarch be led before his chariot. In his absence, he was declared consul for a third time, and in his fourth consulship annihilated an army of the Teutones, and in his fifth routed the Cimbri. He again celebrated a triumph, this time over the Cimbri and the Teutones. In his sixth consulship, he liberated the state when it had been thrown into chaos by the seditions of a tribune of the plebs and a praetor who had armed themselves and occupied the Capitoline Hill. When he was aged more than 70 years, he was expelled from his country through civil strife and was restored through force and made consul for a seventh time. Dot, dot, dot. And the inscription breaks off a little bit after that. It no longer exists, but it was there for everyone to see during the Renaissance period, about 1,500 years after it was put up. It's a stunning list of accomplishments. A war hero, a statesman worthy of admiration and emulation, a man truly to be ranked among the founders of the city of Rome. But many people in his own day, and perhaps even most modern students of history, have considered Gaius Marius to be a monster. And there have been many readers of history who would say, you know, it's ironic that in a grand monument commemorating the new Roman peace, a statue should stand there depicting a man that most of all deserves the blame for starting all those civil wars in the first place. I'm Alex Petkus, and you are listening to The Cost of Glory, where it is our mission to retell the lives of the famous Greek and Roman heroes in order to sharpen ourselves for the present. 
we use Plutarch as our guide. This is episode one of three of the life of Gaius Marius. So, which version of Marius is closer to the truth? The savior of the Republic version or the destroyer of the Republic version? Well, opinion has been pretty sharply divided from his lifetime on. Marius was the kind of man that made it impossible to be indifferent to him. And one thing that makes his life even more remarkable is that the achievements that he's loved or hated for, he accomplished as an older man. In fact, at 50 years old, his story was practically just beginning. Maybe yours is too. But there are some signs that earlier in his life he got noticed by people who were paying attention. The first time that we hear about someone noticing Marius, it happened in Spain. In his early 20s, Marius was stationed as a soldier there. Spain was a turbulent province. The year was 134 BC. Now, the Romans took control of Spain from the Carthaginians at the end of the Second Punic War. That was about 70 years earlier. But really, they just took control of the Mediterranean coast on the east side of Spain. So the interior, the hinterland, was filled with various independent, non-Roman, non-Carthaginian groups and peoples, Celts and Iberians and Celt-Iberians and Lusitanians and many others. Some of them were friendly to the Romans. Some of them hated the Romans for exploiting their land, mining their mountains, demanding tribute and taxes, killing or enslaving resistors. And there had been a big flare-up. The Romans were calling it a rebellion. The city that was leading the rebellion was called Numantia. It was large and nearly impregnable. Marius had been camped outside it for several years now. He was 23, 134 BC. Marius had seen diplomacy fail. He'd seen many Roman commanders fail to take the city by storm or siege. The Romans were getting exasperated. They had lost thousands of men. Nobody wanted to get deployed to Spain. Soldiers thought of it almost like a death sentence. It was hard to imagine even what victory would look like in these circumstances. And as Plutarch puts it, I'm paraphrasing here, what the Romans would call brigandage, lawless mountain warlords plundering and murdering Roman businessmen and soldiers, the Spaniards regarded that as the most noble and patriotic occupation men could take up. Now, not so long ago, the Romans had had much better enemies. When Marius was younger, he remembered hearing about the sack of Corinth. Rome had finally subdued mainland Greece. The Greeks were a noble, civilized people. They fought hard, but now that they had lost, they were being cooperative. And in that same year, in 146 BC, that Corinth was taken, Marius was 11, the Romans had also finally destroyed their age-old enemy, the great city of Carthage in modern-day Tunisia. And that was the end of the Third Punic War, the final one. And after that, Africa shouldn't be giving them any trouble anymore. So they thought. Marius had heard about all this as a kid, a small town boy, practically a nobody, growing up in a pretty insignificant little provincial town called Arpinum. Those were legendary Roman victories against great foes. But here in Spain, the Romans just couldn't stop fighting inconsequential little battles and never really winning a war. But Numantia now, Numantia and the huge revolt that they were leading, this was a step up in seriousness. The tribes had united and they decided they wanted the Romans gone for good. And now, after repeated failures by incompetent generals, the Senate decided to send in Rome's best It was the man who was responsible for winning that war with Carthage, the living legend himself, Scipio Aemilianus. Now they called him Scipio Africanus. When you win a war as a Roman commander, you get a new permanent nickname formed from the region or people that you defeated. So he's Scipio Africanus. And he's known as Scipio Africanus the Younger, by the way. That's to distinguish him from his more famous ancestor who defeated Hannibal the Carthaginian in Africa also, so that Scipio also got the nickname Africanus. So Scipio the Younger comes to Spain, 134 BC, to finish the job, defeat Numantia. And they're sieging the city, and Marius has made enough of a name for himself as, 
I guess the kid you can call on for a hard job, a dirty job. He kept his horses in excellent condition, according to reports. And maybe even then, Scipio, a man who had seen real talent in his life, maybe Scipio perceived the rare energy and grit in this young man. Maybe he saw the gleam of something powerful, something fearsome in Marius. And as the famous story goes, as Plutarch tells it, Scipio himself is dining with his officers and the cadets, and young Marius gets invited too. And he's sitting there quietly next to Scipio. And one of the senior officers, in the course of conversation, maybe he's politely flattering the general, he says, Ah, Scipio, if only we could have you forever. What leader and protector will the Roman people have after you're gone? And then Scipio reaches to Marius, the young cadet next to him, and he pats him gently on the shoulder and says, This one, perhaps? So, that was a story Marius and his friends were fond of telling in later years. Now, soon after Scipio got to Numantia, another impressive young man arrived in Spain, but not from Rome. This one came from Africa, from Numidia. Not to be confused with Numantia, Numidia is more or less Algeria. And this man was from the royal family of Numidia. The Numidians were the new power in Africa, now that the Carthaginians had been subdued, and these Numidians were friends of the Roman people. And this was a young man who arrived, only a few years older than Marius. Tall, tan, powerfully built. He looked a bit like an Egyptian noble, but without any of that softness. He was very good looking, smart. His name was Eugurtha. He came as a representative of the king of Numidia to help Scipio and the Romans in any way he could. Eugurtha spoke good Latin. He was charming, enchanting even, especially to those posh Roman city boys, the senator's sons. He happened to have brought with him all these exotic African gifts, ostrich feathers and ivory and jewels and so on. And Marius watched Eugurtha practically cast a spell over the young officers there. Eugurtha was always visiting their tents. Marius would see them walking around, laughing together. And, well, if Marius was present at a few drinking parties and shared some wine with Eugurtha too, so what? Eugurtha really was that magnetic. He would tell these stories about his wrestling matches, about hunting lions in Africa. But you wonder, could Marius have guessed then what this man was capable of? How they would one day meet on the battlefield? But that was much later. Now, while the Romans were at Numantia, the army received some shocking news from back home. There had been a huge riot in the city near the Forum on election day. Some 300 people had been murdered. They were populist political activists, and they were murdered by a number of distinguished members of the Roman Senate and their gangs. It was done in broad daylight, in the center of the city. Nothing like this had happened in nearly 400 years of Republican history. The senators claimed that they were acting in their capacity as defenders of the Republic. They had assassinated, together with his supporters, a certain politician who was running for re-election. They clubbed them all to death with busted up wooden benches and stones. The politician's name was Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus. Gracchus was one of those blue bloods, for sure. He was the son of a consul. The guy's mom was the daughter of Scipio Africanus the Elder, the man who beat Hannibal. Gracchus was barely 30. He'd been a rising star. He was going to be consul one day, no doubt about it. Till now, of course. But Tiberius Gracchus was very special. He saw that this was a really difficult time for the Republic. There were a lot of problems, hard problems, facing the Republic internally. And Tiberius saw, in these systemic problems, a big opportunity. And later on, Marius would grow to appreciate this fact even more. But Gracchus saw, first of all, what everyone could see. Over the past century, the Romans had gone from being a regional power player, 
a leading city-state in central Italy, to an empire with land holdings and client kings and influence on three continents spanning the Mediterranean. Wealth was pouring in like nobody could have imagined, especially after the final destruction of Carthage and the sack of Corinth that had happened in Gracchus and Marius' youth. Commerce, patronage, loot, slaves. Rome was turning into the center of the world, But anyone who was paying attention could also see that all the wealth and power was getting concentrated in the hands of a tiny portion of the population. This was happening even with the lands that the Romans had captured from their foes. It was supposed to be distributed fairly and shared among the soldiers, but the rich were finding ways to get control of it. Gracchus said this wasn't fair. He proposed redistributing this public land, as it was called, Ager Publicus. Now, the one thing that really impressed Marius about Gracchus was the way that he could channel the energy of the poorer classes. He was very unlike them on one level. He wasn't one of them or anything like that, but he understood them. They knew they were getting screwed. They saw how rich the senators and the savvy equestrians were getting on the spoils of empire. And Gracchus gave them hope. They loved him for it. And he could wield the will of the people like a mighty sword. He would go around town, followed by literally thousands of supporters, whenever he wanted to. He pushed other populist measures through the legislative system, too. He was really courting the Roman plebs, the people, in these acts of his. The problem was, of course, many of the richest and most powerful Romans were the biggest holders of this public land, many powerful senators, and his measures usually came at their expense. Gracchus pushed too far, too fast, and he had broken some important principles. That, at least, was what Marius's commander at Numantia thought. Scipio Aemilianus, Africanus the Younger. Scipio knew how to play the populist game, too, but he also knew where to draw the line. He had tried to warn Tiberius. Scipio was actually married to Gracchus's sister. They were family. Scipio was like a father to Tiberius. The kid's father had actually died when he was young. But then the messengers come to the camp in Spain. Scipio hears the news about the riot and Gracchus's death. And he calls an assembly, announces the message to the camp. Everyone's watching him. You have to imagine it was hard, but Scipio disavowed Gracchus in front of the army. In his speech, he quoted Homer in Greek, thus perish also another whoever would work such a deed. Now, Marius wasn't much for Greek literature, like these aristocrats, but he got the message. Don't mess with the establishment. They'll eat their own if they have to. But then, what was Scipio supposed to do? The Senate had successfully turned Tiberius Gracchus into the enemy of the state. They control the narrative now, no question. And he who has taken control of the narrative at Rome has already won. Now, all this must have been pretty tough on Tiberius's younger brother, Gaius, because Gaius Gracchus was there with them at Numantia. He heard what Scipio said, what his own brother-in-law, his mentor, said. Gaius was, what, 19, 20 years old? A fresh young cadet? What a way to start your public career. We'll treat the Gracchi brothers in more detail when we get to their biographies sometime soon. Now then, Scipio captured Numantia. He ended the war. It was his last great military achievement. And Marius, at this point, mostly fades from the historical record for a few years. But one thing is certain enough. Marius, soon after this, in his mid to late 20s, he turned his attention to money-making. He had to do this. You see, Marius was a young man of incredible ambition. But to make it anywhere in Roman politics, especially those days, you needed a lot of money. Marius came from a relatively humble background, His home city, again, was called Arpinum. It's a little hilltop town, a solid two days journey from Rome. It's to the southeast, halfway to Naples. 
And Arpinum was actually the home also of the great Roman orator, Cicero, of the next generation. Now, Marius' parents were relatively undistinguished. They had a modest plot of land. They were the sort of people who had to do at least some of their own farm work. Not that they were day laborers. They were respected, sure, but only in tiny little Arpinum. But it was a big extended family, at least. They weren't rich, though. However, Unlike many of the surrounding Italian towns, the people of Arpinum, for their good service in past wars, had been awarded full Roman citizenship in the previous generation. Most people in Rome had barely heard of the place. Marius never even saw Rome until he was a teenager. But being a citizen allowed him to dream big. And maybe, as a boy, he dreamed so big that the other kids would make fun of him. So... Perhaps it was there in Arpinum that he learned to keep his cards close to his chest. Well, once he got to Rome as a young man, he learned to fit in, mainly in the army. He had to practice to get rid of his southern accent. Or maybe he didn't eradicate it entirely, because he also wanted to stand out, too. He wanted people to think he was a little different, to remember him. The aristocrats at Rome usually had three names, Tiberius Sempronius Gracchus, Quintus Caecilius Metellus. Sometimes they even had four or five. Marius only had two, but that made it easy to remember. Just Gaius Marius, sir. Now, as we were saying, one thing that Marius learned quickly was that in order to hold power in Rome, you had to have serious money. And you weren't actually even allowed to run for the big offices unless you could prove that you had substantial wealth. And then to actually get elected, well, you had to make a lot of friends. You had to have them over for dinner, get those friends to do you a lot of favors. And also, none of the high offices came with any salary. You had to front all the costs. It could easily ruin a man financially. So... When Marius got back from Numantia, he set about building his fortune. And to do this, he made a lot of friends among the Roman equestrians. Now, the equestrians, or the knights, as they are sometimes called, equites in Latin literally means horsemen, it was actually a property rating, a designation of the populace according to wealth. And in theory, these people were, back in the day, the citizens wealthy enough to supply their own horse in the cavalry. But now they were just, it was just a property census. They were citizens that were below the senators in wealth rank. So they were still an elite. We're talking maybe 5% of the citizen population max, but not the tip-top people. But now that Rome had a sizable empire, these guys had emerged as the business class. The equestrians knew how to turn a little into a lot. They were doing trade and commerce, money lending, And these were actually things that the senators weren't supposed to get their hands dirty with. Senators were supposed to be already rich, so they could focus on law and politics and war. So equestrians were the ones who were actually good at business. But some of the biggest money was in government contracting. The Senate didn't like to have to have permanent bureaucrats running things like tax collecting, military supply, harbor dues, and so they outsourced it to private syndicates of equestrians. And to organize all this, the equestrians formed what some people would call the first multinational corporations in Western history. So these were the kinds of ventures Marius got involved in, the kind of men Marius got very intimate with, and he came to really see things from their perspective. And later in his career, that perspective was going to be every bit as valuable as the money he was making. But he never forgot that he wasn't going to be like them. Not forever, at least. A lot of equestrians had kind of settled into their station in society. They would say to him, Why keep fighting your way up in the ranks in the army? Why aspire to be a commander? Why get so involved in law and politics, chasing after glory Risk your life and your fortune trying to climb that greasy pole when you could just be filthy rich in comfortable obscurity. As a senator, there's always someone trying to shove you off the top of the mountain and take your spot. Better to be an equestrian. But Marius wanted to be on top, and he wasn't afraid of a fight. 
he followed politics very attentively. And the 120s BC were a decade to remember in Roman politics. If the staunch conservatives in the Senate thought that they could get rid of populist sentiment in Rome by murdering Tiberius Gracchus, they were very wrong. Because most of the problems Tiberius was proposing to solve were still around. The Roman lower classes still craved a champion of their interests. And now, Tiberius Gracchus' brother stepped in to pick up the torch that he had dropped. Gaius Gracchus was elected to be one of the tribunes of the plebs in 124 BC. Marius could see where this was headed. This office, the tribune of the plebs, or the tribune of the people, it was the office that Gaius's brother, Tiberius, had used to challenge the power of the vested interests of the rich men, the men who dominated the Roman Senate. The tribunes of the plebs, well, there were 10 of them every year, it was an office that was reserved, ideally, for the purpose of defending the people's interest against the nobility, and, if necessary, also against the higher magistrates, the other magistrates, men holding offices like consul and praetor. The consuls, by the way, were the highest office. There were two of them every year. And these and almost all of the offices in the Roman Republic were one-year terms. Now, the tribunes had the power to veto laws and actions that were undertaken by the higher-powered magistrates, as well as the other tribunes. And by this point in history, they even had the authority to haul a consul off to jail. To actually do that, though, was pretty rare and kind of dangerous. And really, whether these powers got exercised to the fullest, it all depended on the individual tribune. And often, tribunes were actually on the side of the nobles. Now, as we said, tribunes also had the power to enact laws. There were several ways of getting laws passed and several different authoritative voting assemblies in Rome. And the consuls controlled one of them and the tribunes controlled another one of them. The one the tribunes could call and pass laws in with the majority vote was the Council of the People, the Concilium Plebis. And any plebeian citizen, that is, Everybody but the noble families could vote in it. And when you had a vote for a law that that council held, it was called a plebiscite. This was the voting body, this council of the plebs, where Tiberius Gracchus had had his land redistribution law passed as a tribune against the Senate's disapproval in a plebiscite. So the Senate disapproved, but Tiberius knew, though, that the Senate actually had very limited official formal powers. It was mostly just an advisory body composed of the richest and most powerful men in the city. And so he tested their limits and he crossed the line. But now his brother Gaius started testing the limits again. As tribune, Gaius had several more controversial laws passed through the Concilium Plebis. Gaius liked to use his older brother's death as a rhetorical stick to beat the hardliner conservatives with. He would bring up the memory of Tiberius in his rally speeches in the forum, and he'd talk about how the nobles wanted him dead too now. It was amazing to watch Gaius speak, how he could channel the people's anger at the inequalities of their society about the unjust murder of his brother. One time, a little earlier, Gaius Gracchus confronted his brother-in-law, Scipio Aemilianus, in a public assembly, caught him off guard. He asked Scipio what he thought of the death of Tiberius. Well, Scipio started by saying many of the things that he said at Numantia in front of the whole army. It was nuanced. He could see that the ends which Tiberius pursued might arguably be just, but the methods which flew in the face of sacred Roman tradition and so on. But nobody heard the rest of his speech over the eruptions of loud jeering, and he ended up getting booed off stage without even finishing. And after that, whenever Scipio would rise to speak in front of the people, he would get shouted at and interrupted. It was stunning to watch. Scipio had been the grandest Roman of his day, loved by all, and now he was getting heckled like a cheap juggler. Nobody could remember anything like this happening. The mood at Rome was tense.
And then, in 129 BC, Scipio Africanus the Younger, the sacker of Carthage, victor of Numantia, was found dead in his home. There was no indisputable cause of death, no open wound. He had been fine the day before. He left a tablet by his bed to write a speech that he was going to give the next day. When his body was examined, though, there were signs of a struggle, that he had been somehow, maybe, restrained and suffocated. It would have taken several men to bring down a man like Scipio. No charges were ever brought, though. People suspected one of Gaius Gracchus's more violent associates of orchestrating a murder, but nobody dared prosecute. Seeing the nobility humbled, cowed for fear of the common people and its leaders, this all left a deep impression on the young Marius. The Gracchi brothers and people like them, they were starting to be called populares around that time, men of the people. These men were revealing the gaps in the political fortifications, the chinks in the armor of the entrenched nobility who were the so-called optimates. It was thrilling. Tribunes were not supposed to make laws in the face of open disapproval from the Senate. Sure, there was no law against this, but it was custom, tradition, to consult the Senate before calling a popular assembly. And the people, well, they just weren't supposed to vote en masse for laws that the Senate cried out against. But Tiberius, and now Gaius, did it anyway. They showed that it could be done. Gaius proposed a law instituting a subsidized grain distribution for the poor Roman citizens. State-funded discount grain? Demagoguery, they said. But it passed, became the law of the land. And there were other laws, some of them more threatening to the optimates. And we'll leave them for the story of the Gracchi. But Gaius himself didn't learn his brother's lesson. He even had supporters in the Senate, but he pushed too far. And powerful men started looking for an excuse to get rid of him. And there was only so much that his noble sympathizers could do. In 121 BC, he was no longer in office as a tribune. He had run in the election the previous year, actually. But somehow, the most popular tribune in a generation lost. And people widely suspected that the party of the Optimates and the Senate had tampered with the votes. Tribunes were sacrosanct. The magistrates weren't allowed to lay a hand on them within the city limits. It was a sacrilege. So now, as his term expired, Gracchus was no longer sacrosanct. He was vulnerable. And some scuffle happened while Gracchus was on the Capitoline Hill in a public square with some friends in the center of town. And who knows who started it, but someone got stabbed. It was one of the clients of the Optimates, and the guy died. And this was the excuse that the Optimates had been waiting for. One of the two consuls at the time was an ultra-conservative hothead named Lucius Opimius. And the next day after the scuffle, Opimius claimed that Gracchus was trying to start a revolution. And he called on the Senate to declare a state of emergency. And Gaius and his supporters, they rally to the south part of town, to the Aventine Hill, and they fortify the strong points to defend themselves. But the consul Apemius leads what amounts to a small army to the Aventine, and they treat Gracchus and his party like they would any horde of barbarians occupying the city. And by the end of the day, Gracchus and several prominent politician associates of his and 3,000 other men are all dead and their bodies are thrown into the Tiber River. Gaius Gracchus was only 30 years old. Hi folks, we'll get back to the story in just a second. A quick thanks to our sponsor though, ideamarket.io. Idea Market is an innovative new internet application designed to radically shift the incentive structures around quality information on the internet. 
they have a creative way you can, uh, I'm paraphrasing here, place bets with real money on quality sources of information on the internet in a decentralized way without the use of your usual trusted third parties like, say, corporate media outlets. And they are using blockchain technology to pull it all off. It's very interesting and exciting, and they are working on solving a real serious problem for sure. Check out ideamarket.io to find out more. You can read their white paper there and see how you can start playing around. Or check the link in the show notes for that. Now, throughout all these events, Marius kept out of trouble. He did his best to make sure his allegiances weren't known. He was a military man, just a hard-working soldier citizen. But he was watching. He watched as Opimius, the very man who had murdered 3,000 Romans, commissioned a temple to Concordia, the goddess of harmony, in the Forum. Amazing. But Marius also saw the people, on their own initiative, erect statues of Tiberius and Gaius Gracchus in a prominent place in the city. Humble folk would pass by and make little first fruit offerings to them, little sacrifices, and people would actually kneel in front of the statues and make prayers to them like deities. The Gracchi were dead, but the energy that they had tapped into was all still there, seething below the surface. And maybe, if someone was savvy enough, if someone could tap into the angers and desires of the populace of Rome, but at the same time avoid the hammer strike of the opimius types. Maybe if you didn't overplay your hand like the Gracchi clearly had, someone who could pull it off could have tremendous influence at Rome. And the very next year, Marius saw his chance open up. He was 37. That year, one of the friends of the Gracchi was elected tribune, and this man dared to prosecute Opimius for illegally imprisoning citizens without charging them. Opimius was, of course, acquitted. No surprise there. But what was really interesting was what happened next. The Optimates, the conservative faction, they set up a counter-prosecution. Some nonsense they cooked up about how Opimius' prosecutor had taken a bribe. They wanted to teach this guy a lesson. But this guy, Subulo was his name, he was acquitted. And this was significant. The Optimates could usually figure out how to bribe the juries when they wanted to. But this time, their counter-strike had failed. And Marius decided to finally make his move. He ran for tribune that year himself. He got elected as one of the ten tribunes for the following term, 119 BC. In his campaign, though, he was very savvy. He relied on some old family friends that he had, or rather patrons, the Metelli family. These guys were hardcore optimates, but Marius's family had been their clients in this old semi-formal system that the Romans had of clients and patrons, mutual exchanges of favors and obligations. Optimates had often supported their own candidates for tribune, and so Marius convinced the Metelli that he could be their man in the College of Tribunes, as they called the group of tribunes. The Metelli were a big and powerful clan, and it seemed like every year in those days there was some Metellus or other in high office. They could use someone like Marius. Sure, they made a deal. But to everyone's surprise, one of the first things that Marius did as tribune was propose a controversial populist law. See, when the Romans would vote for candidates or submit their verdicts as jurors, the actual ballot boxes were separated from the main gathering area by a ditch, and you had to cross over a little bridge to get to the ballot boxes. And when you did that, you could get harassed by anyone pushy enough, and they could get up on the bridge with you, and they could easily see over your shoulder how you voted or judged. You know, men would be there. Nice guys. And maybe they just stand there and greet you by name. But it was a polite reminder the Optimates know how you're voting. And this was one of the ways that the Optimates managed to get their own candidates elected so often and sway important political trials. 
everyone knew it. And Marius proposed narrowing the bridge so that only one person could get over to the ballot box at a time. No more grinning thugs looking over your shoulders at the ballot. So the Senate calls a meeting to discuss the law, and they summon Marius. And he sits there and listens. One of the consuls, Cotta, an optimate, rails and thunders against this proposal. This is preposterous and unnecessary, contrary to our sacred political traditions, needless expense, blah, blah, blah. And the Senate takes a vote, and they resolve to oppose the law. Marius then stands up, and he threatens to have Cotta dragged to prison if he doesn't rescind the vote. He exercises his veto as tribune. Cotta is shocked. He fumes, and he calls on the other consul to support him, Caecilius Metellus, the very man whose coattails Marius rode into office. Metellus speaks up in favor of Cotta and the Senate's resolution. Marius then calls his officers to arrest Metellus and drag him off to jail too. And Metellus is astonished, and he calls on the other tribunes present to restrain their colleague. Do something about this. No response. They stand firm. And Metellus backs down. And the Senate rescinds its resolution. And Marius and the tribunes go out, and they have the law passed officially in a plebiscite. Done. And this is really the moment when Marius first pulled his mask aside just a little bit. That mask of the simple provincial soldier, just a stand-up guy doing his duty, minding his business. Hmm. The Metelli and the other optimates realize here maybe this might be a very different man from the one we thought he was. And Marius did just enough to prove that he couldn't be pushed around by the rich and the powerful. But then Marius turns around the other way. So some tribunes are proposing extending the grain subsidy, spending more state money on handouts to the poor citizens. And this time, Marius stands with the conservatives, and he opposes it. He opposes this populist largesse. It's not prudent. It'll bankrupt the state. Whatever he had to say. The point was, all in his one year of tribuneship, he showed the people that he was capable of taking a hard stance against the nobility to champion their interests, and he showed the Roman bosses he should be feared, but if they were reasonable, he was also someone you could work with. So after his tribuneship, Marius felt good enough about his prospects to run for a more competitive office for the year. It was called Edel, Idilis in Latin, sort of like a city commissioner position. It was a stepping stone for higher offices. And there were actually two ranks of these. Each of them were elected by a separate voting body. Marius ran for the higher ranking one and lost. And then he made the very unusual step of turning around and running for the lower ranking edelship too. And then he failed there also. It was very embarrassing. And the aristocracy was laughing at him behind his back. Pathetic striver. And they probably thought he'd give up on a public career now like any self-respecting man would. But then Marius did lay low for a little bit, but he raised some capital, did some canvassing, and he came back to the stump to run for office. But he was 40 years old now, and he was done with stepping stones. He skipped the eel ship and went straight up and ran for the office of Praetor, the second highest rank. And this time, he squeezed by. Of the six praetors elected, he was the one with the fewest votes. But a praetor is a praetor. And by this time, he'd made a lot of friends in the Senate. And there were actually a lot of guys in there with populist leanings. And maybe they had helped him figure out what it really took to get elected, so to speak. At least, after his victory at the polls... Some of his enemies organized a prosecution for electoral bribery. And even if Marius had been a little bit, let's say, 
generous with his supporters. Well, weren't most of the other senators generous men, too? Anyway, Marius was acquitted of bribery charges, but it was close. The jury reportedly was evenly split, and according to the rules, however, a tie defaulted to a not guilty verdict. So with that inconvenience behind him, the praetorship was a huge leg up in Marius' career. It was a major office, with serious legal and disciplinary powers, huge influence on policy, opportunities for patronage, and he knew exactly what he had to achieve in his term of office, as little as possible. That is, don't ruffle any feathers of the powerful. Make friends, conciliate. You're not a striver anymore. You've arrived. Act like it. Keep your peace. And he did. Typically, Roman praetors, after their year of office, were sent off on various important foreign missions by the Senate, and they were sent as so-called pro-praetors. Former praetors made up the main pool of provincial governors, and Marius played his cards so well, so politely as praetor, that he got a big prize for his pro-praetorship, his foreign tour after his year in office. It was the province of nearer Spain, where he, of course, had some experience. Now that it was more pacified, Spain was literally a gold mine. And not just that, it was also rich in silver, tin, lead, and agricultural produce. But how was he going to play his hand now? Because he could easily screw this up. What governors in the richer provinces would often do, especially the blue blood senator types who had inherited their wealth and didn't really know how to make money the right way, is they would go out and plunder and abuse the provincials, extract taxes, seize property. But Marius knew that that kind of thing was a huge risk for a man of his ambitions. For one thing, it made the Romans look bad and it got them involved in costly wars. But more specifically, it would leave you open to prosecution when you got home from your tour of duty. And exile was common for corrupt governors. Now, those senators' sons could use their money and powerful allies to block prosecutions and sway verdicts, but it was harder for a man like Marius. Someone like him had to be squeaky clean. But he also knew you didn't have to break the law to make money in Spain. Spain was a Roman businessman's paradise, and the equestrians were making a killing there. Usually, at least, that was the case, but... Even though there was no large-scale rebellion now, there were still serious problems with so-called banditry. The native Iberians were plundering and raiding and robbing. More charitably, you might have called it the guerrilla warfare of patriotic freedom fighters. Either way, it was bad for business. So Marius makes it his mission to make Spain a great cash cow again. And he cleans up crime and banditry in the province. And in the process, he makes a lot of friends with the local equestrian business syndicates. He can relate to these people, many of them prominent and influential Italians without citizenship, with no political prospects in Rome, but plenty of cash and friends. He had been an outsider like them once. He might still be if he weren't a citizen, and he might need their help one day. And while he was at all this, most importantly, he also laid the groundwork for a massive personal fortune. He acquired a huge tract of mineral rights in southern Spain. These mining areas of his were in a mountain range that's now called the Sierra Morena, but for most of antiquity, after this time, it became known as Mons Marianus, the mountain of the Marius family, and his descendants were still mining it 200 years later. So Marius returned to Rome, a man with prospects. He married into a certain noble patrician family. The girl's family name was Julia. Her father's name was Gaius Julius Caesar. And she was actually the aunt of the famous Julius Caesar. That one hadn't been born yet, though. They were nobles. It was a great name. Yes, but they were not top aristocrats. And these actually weren't very flashy people, and that was good because neither was Marius. 
To everyone, especially to the plebs, Marius was still just the simple soldier, just a provincial, a countryman, an honest Roman, trying to do his duty. Meanwhile, the money and the friends were pouring in. But deep down, Marius knew what he wanted, what he was capable of. Nobody becomes the greatest Roman alive in times of peace. And Marius hadn't yet gotten a chance to show the Romans how good he really was. Fortunately, there was a major problem brewing for Rome in general and for the aristocracy in particular right at that time. And it had to do with their old pal, Jugurtha, the Numidian prince who had wowed the senator's sons in Spain. Yes, the lion hunter. He was back home in Numidia in North Africa. You see, Jugurtha was a nephew of the king of Numidia, but the king had adopted him as his own. And then the king died, and on his deathbed, he divided his kingdom three ways, between his two legitimate sons and then Jugurtha. But very soon after, Jugurtha had one of the sons murdered, and he took his share of the kingdom. Of course, it was self-defense, so he claimed. But the Romans knew Jugurtha, and they also knew he was aiming at seizing the whole of the kingdom eventually. And now he was making obvious steps to take the rest of it from the brother that was left. And, well, the Numidians were longtime friends and allies of the Romans. Really, it was basically a client kingdom. And Rome was trading extensively with Numidia, drawing auxiliary recruits for the army from there. It was in their sphere of influence. Again, we're talking about modern Algeria, more or less. Really, the northern strip near the coast, which is fertile and temperate. And so the Romans send an embassy to mediate between the remaining son and Jugurtha. But the embassy of the Romans ends up ruling heavily in favor of Jugurtha, the aggressor. Some people were apparently surprised by this. Certainly people who knew Jugurtha were not. And soon afterwards, it is discovered that the Roman ambassadors have taken massive bribes from Jugurtha. And they were quite shameless about it, too. And who was the leader of the embassy, the main recipient of bribes, but Lucius Opimius, the very man who as consul had led the military crackdown on Gaius Gracchus and his followers, that legally sanctioned massacre just a few years earlier. The Roman general public is outraged, and the tribunes of the plebs step in and fan the flames. How nice. Now all our allies know that if they want to just do as they please, they can just go and make some already rich guy much richer, and then Rome won't bother them. And it certainly isn't the plebs getting any of that bribe money. And the populares organize a prosecution, and this time they get Opimius convicted. He thought he was untouchable, but no, he gets sent to Albania to rot in exile. Meanwhile, Jugurtha consolidates his power, and, well, always something new out of Africa, within a year or two, he corners his remaining cousin and rival, his name was Adderbal, and he lays siege to him in a city not far from the coast. It's called Kirta. It's modern-day Constantina in Algeria, a beautiful city. And in that particular city, it was one of the capital cities of Adderbal's kingdom, well, there were a lot of Roman businessmen resident there. Traders, moneylenders, Italians, and equestrian types. And they're all under siege there with the locals. Rome sends an embassy led by some more prominent nobles. Jugurtha charms them delays them, and sends them back to Rome with various excuses. And people suspected that he sent them back with some nice presents, too, but that was never proven. And once the embassy leaves, in utter failure, you might say, Jugurtha forces the city to surrender. He has Adderbal, his remaining rival, executed. And he massacres not just the native Numidian citizens, but as many of the Roman businessmen as he can get his hands on. He confiscates their money and their goods. (music) 
Now things were starting to get interesting for Marius. Now it wasn't just the plebs that were outraged, it was the equestrians too. The plebs demand a war. The equestrians demand a war. The Senate hesitates. It's not so obvious what the war objective should be. The Senate doesn't like the idea of just conquering an allied kingdom over an internal dispute. It sets a bad precedent. Complete conquest is expensive. It would be much simpler and even maybe more profitable on balance to just patch things up with Jugurtha and leave the status quo as it was. But now they really have no choice politically. And so they reluctantly put together an army and they send a consul down to Numidia, a guy named Calpurnius Bestia, to do something. And he did do something. There were some nominal shows of force at first. But the main thing Bestia achieved was getting a bribe from Jugurtha to declare another peace treaty that was remarkably lenient on Jugurtha. And he returns to Rome and he tries to call it a victory. It was amazing. The tribunes in the Populares camp have information about the bribery, though. Bestia was so shameless, he barely covered his tracks. And they want blood. They want Bestia to pay. And you wonder, at this point, with the network that Marius had, did he maybe feed the tribunes a few arguments? Well, the tribunes address the popular assembly. Whatever happened to the Romans who drove King Pyrrhus out of Italy, the Romans who defeated Hannibal and humbled the Carthaginians, the Romans who sacked Numantia, conquered Macedonia, and these nobles who are now selling off Rome's honor are the same people who had the Gracchi murdered in the streets of our once great city. The tribunes pass a plebiscite to summon Jugurtha himself to Rome and testify against Bestia. The Senate is a little shocked, but they can't really do anything about it. And Jugurtha arrives. But he's been told time and time again by his posh friends among the Roman nobility that at Rome, everything is for sale. That's a famous line of his, by the way. At Rome, everything is for sale. And so Jugurtha, or one of his friends, buys off two of the tribunes of the plebs, some cronies of the optimates, and they block his testimony with their veto. Well, Jugurtha gets sent back to Numidia, but the populares tribunes do manage to convict Bestia anyway. Jugurtha goes back to mopping up holdouts in Numidia, consolidating his power, and the Senate sends another consul with another crew of effete, incompetent nobles, and after another year, they've accomplished basically nothing. And so, for the following year after that, a Metellus is elected consul. Now, Marius had to give this guy some credit. This man, Quintus Caecilius Metellus, whatever he lacked in cunning and political intelligence, he made up for with brute honesty. He was actually a decent guy. At least, there was no dirt on him. And this is one of the reasons that he got elected. He was promising to clean up the Numidia mess, and the plebs genuinely thought that he actually might not take a bribe. This was the cousin of the Metellus that Marius had threatened to haul off to jail 10 years earlier. And actually, for the Sertorius fans among you, this is the father of the man that Sertorius later fought in Spain. And so now Quintus Metellus is consul, and Marius makes his move. He spent the last decade rebuilding bridges, conciliating the nobility, and now he offers his services to Metellus. Metellus is reluctant, for obvious reasons, but he needs a guy with a good track record and a good reputation, and Marius has that, and that was rare these days. In every official duty Marius has taken up, he has acted in such a way that he seemed worthy of greater office than the one he was holding. And as the Roman writer Sallust said, Marius had industry, probity, a great knowledge of soldiering, and a temperament which was remarkable in war, but restrained at home, unconquered by cravings or riches, hungry only for glory. End quote. And you could add that 
the war that they were going to fight was going to be basically against guerrilla insurgents. And Marius had a proven track record of dealing with this kind of war in Spain from his governorship there. And so Metellus takes him on as a lieutenant, what the Romans called a legate. You won't regret it, sir. And they board the ship and they set off to Numidia. When they get to the main Roman base in Numidia, they're assailed with the stench of a dysfunctional army camp. Soldiers were spending all their time there instead of, you know, soldiering. There were no fortifications, no organized watches, no discipline. The soldiers were selling off their official grain rations to go buy tastier food and trinkets and then turning to cheap banditry, sieging local villas, driving off livestock and capturing slaves, trading all these for wine, buying expensive baked bread because they sold off all their flour and never felt like cooking. It was disgraceful. Metellus puts a stop to all this. He lays down rules, brings the army into fighting shape again. Metellus's plan for Jugurtha was to slowly capture cities and land and gradually erode Jugurtha's support base and then maybe get some trusted friend of his to betray him. And within a few months, he was doing a decent job. Marius, his legate, really was proud to be part of this new operation. There weren't many great battles, more like an unending series of skirmishes, but some of them got pretty dicey. When Marius was leading cavalry charges. He was Metellus' master of the horse. A lot of their work was chasing down and chasing away these swift Numidian riders who would come up and attack and then vanish. They were very tricky, and they really knew the land. And here's what Plutarch says about Marius as a legate in Numidia. And deeming that he had been not so much called by Metellus to the office of legate as introduced by fortune to the most favorable opportunity and great theater for exploits, he made a display of every sort of bravery and though the war brought many hardships, he never shunned any great labor, nor disdained any that was small, but surpassed the officers of his own rank in giving good counsel and foreseeing what was advantageous, and vied with the common soldiers in frugality and endurance. He thus won much goodwill among them, for in general it seems that every man finds solace for his labors in seeing another voluntarily shared those labors. This seems to take away the feeling of being forced. And it is a most agreeable spectacle for a Roman soldier to see a general eating common bread in public or sleeping on a simple pallet or taking a hand in the construction of some trench or palisade. For they have not so much admiration for leaders who distribute honors and riches among them as they do for leaders who share in their toil and danger. So Marius is impressing everyone. He's inspiring the men with a sense of purpose and hope, but the war drags on. Jugurtha was incredibly elusive and slippery, and they're making progress, but not so fast as everyone was hoping. And Marius, a year and a half or so in, he begins to see an opening. The way he later told the story, and Marius most certainly was a very gifted storyteller, well, he was in Utica, near the coast, and he was doing his usual prayers and sacrifices to the gods, like you're supposed to before important military undertakings. And his soothsayer, after looking at the entrails of the sacrificial victims, discerning the will of the gods, he says to him, Marius, you should know, the gods are portending great and marvelous things for you. You should put your trust in them. Turn whatever it is you are dreaming into a reality. Test fortune as much as you can. It will turn out successfully for you. And so, Marius approaches Metellus. He shows his hand. Sir, I would like to return to Rome to run for the next year's consulship in the elections. Will you support my bid? And Metellus shows his hand too. Metellus gets this look of friendly pity in his face. Marius, come on, my friend. 
he tells Marius. Now, why would you want to do something rash, like run for consul, coming from a family like yours? And at that moment, all of Marius' assumptions about the stale Roman nobility were confirmed. Metellus was, of course, talking about the fact that nobody from a humble background, nobody whose family didn't include praetors and consuls already, no new man, as they called it, had become consul for nearly 30 years, and that guy had been a complete toady of the nobles. It had only happened four other times in the last century that a new man became consul. The nobles had a near monopoly on the consulate. That doesn't happen by accident. They passed it from hand to hand in their exclusive little group. But Marius wouldn't drop the issue. He starts bringing up the question with Metellus on different occasions. Metellus is amazed by the man's boldness. And one day he loses patience. They're at dinner. And Marius brings it up again in front of everyone. And Metellus, with his usual contemptuous little chuckle, he pats his 20-year-old son on the back and says, Marius, I'll support you for consul when my son makes his bid for the consulate. You can run together. And there was laughter. Marius didn't laugh. That would have meant another 20 years. So, Marius decides to take matters into his own hands. He discreetly approaches the many businessmen working in the various cities of Numidia, the equestrian types. Isn't it strange how Metellus just can't seem to finish this war? He's getting plunder, winning battles, getting the prestige. Meanwhile, your profits are tanking with all this instability. How hard could it be? Or maybe Metellus doesn't want this war to be over anytime soon. If Gaius Marius got the supreme command, I'd have Jugurtha in chains within a few days. And Marius approaches his friends among the officer corps, too. He tells them the story that they're happy to hear. Letters start pouring in to every part of Rome from all over Numidia. Metellus is sluggish. He's dragging out the war. Tired old man. Won't be long before Jugurtha buys him off, too if it hasn't happened already. Marius is his best officer. He's done amazing deeds. He's considering a bid for the consulship. He could finish this war in no time. And Metellus realizes all too late what's happening. He's even losing control of the narrative in Africa. There's discontent among the soldiers. It's no use keeping Marius there. It would do more harm than good. Not that he could ever pin Marius down on any particular charge of insubordination. Well, Metellus can just finish Jugurtha off without him. Let Marius go home and lose like all the other upstarts. And so he sends Marius home just before the elections. He barely gave him any time to mount his campaign in person. But Marius knew how to get things done, and he could outwork anyone. He set sail from Utica one morning and he was in Rome by the next evening. By the time the voting day arrived, he and his network had pulled in supporters from all over the countryside to cast their votes. Gaius Marius was the businessman's candidate. He was the Italian's candidate, the country folk's candidate, the shopkeeper's candidate, the soldier's candidate, the people's candidate, the man who had stood up to more than one Metellus in his day, Marius was the man who was going to show the fat old entitled nobility a thing or two about soldiering and real competence. He had the full support of the tribunes of the plebs. And he grabbed the consulship in a landslide. He seized it from the rich and well-born like the spoils of battle, as he later said. At 50 years old, it was a long battle. But Marius' mask was finally off. He would be the scourge of the optimates if they stood in his way. Who knows, he might even master the Senate. All in good time. But before he could do any of that, he had a big problem to solve. The assignment of provincial and military commands, like the one that Metellus had, was made by the Senate. And right before the elections, 
the Senate had assigned the command of the war in Numidia to Metellus for another year. And even if he could somehow take that command, Marius knew that he actually needed more soldiers if he was going to defeat Jugurtha in any reasonable amount of time. That was another thing he'd need the Senate's authorization for. And after all the promises that he made and powerful people that he'd insulted in his campaign, if he couldn't bring home Jugurtha in chains fast, well, his career was effectively over. And that, friends, is how Gaius Marius rose from being an obscure provincial Italian to holding the supreme office at Rome. And his story is just getting started. Stay tuned for the next episode when we'll meet even more formidable enemies than Jugurtha, including Marius' new protege and later his greatest rival. Meanwhile, if you enjoyed this, sign up for our weekly Ancient Philosophy emails at ancientlifecoach.com and consider leaving us a review on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. It really helps us out. There's a link in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Stay strong. Stay ancient. Until next time, this is Alex Petkus. Alex Petkus.